love, money, madness, and murder. Here's your host, John, with more classic movie reviews. Welcome to today's show. My name is John. As always, you can subscribe to the show on iTunes or follow the links to social media in the podcast show notes. You can also go to snarkymoviereviews.com to read notes, bios, and other random movie thoughts. Remember, this show is completely free and independent. All I ask is that you jump over to iTunes and give me a review. Today's movie is Sunset Boulevard, 1950. Sunset Boulevard is certainly one of the greatest movies in American history. It is also one of the greatest film noirs of all time. At release, the film was nominated for 11 Oscars and received three. Time Magazine stated, Hollywood at its worst, told by Hollywood at its best. This movie not only had faces, it had dialogue, storytelling, passion, and suspense. Told in noir fashion, this film begins at the death of one of the two main characters. As the story is revealed, the watcher is able to see the intricate dance that brought on the death. The Actors We've covered a few of the actors previously, so I'll jump right in with them. The first is the great William Holden who played the role of Down on His Luck writer Joe Gillis. Holden was first covered during episode 79, Stalag 17, 1953, a role for which he received the Oscar he should have gotten for Sunset Boulevard. The stone-faced Buster Keaton played himself as an actor that time had passed and one of the few remaining friends of Norma Desmond. Buster Keaton was covered in episode 58, The General, 1926. Another member of Nora Desmond's Waxworks was H.B. Warner. Warner was covered in episode 53, It's a Wonderful Life, 1946. The wonderfully talented star Gloria Swanson played the role of Norma Desmond. Norma had everything but youth. Swanson was born in Chicago in 1899. After Gloria finished school, she became a sales clerk in a department store. On a visit to a movie production studio in 1915, because she was so beautiful, Gloria was picked from the crowd to be a bit player The Fable of Elvira and Farina, 1915, and The Meal Ticket, 1915. Gloria had another small role in At the End of a Perfect Day, 1915, and finally got a bigger role in Sweetie Goes to College, 1915. By the mid-1920s, Gloria was the highest paid actress in Hollywood, reportedly having spent over $8 million in that decade alone. The fact that she had seven husbands and her general escapades made her a fan favorite. Gloria was 30 when films started being made with sound. Those that bet she wouldn't make the transition were dead wrong. In 1928, she was nominated for Best Actress for Sadie Thompson. She was nominated again the next year for The Trespasser, 1929. Gloria only made four films during the 1930s, with the last being Music in the Air, 1934. She returned for Father Takes a Wife, 1941. Amazingly, she did not take another role until Sunset Boulevard, 1950. For this film, she was nominated again for Best Actress, but lost for the third time. From this point forward, Gloria was more or less retired. She would occasionally show up on a television show like the Beverly Hillbillies, she did play herself in the disaster film Airport 1975, made in 1974. Miss Swanson died in 1983 at the age of 86. Eric von Stroheim played the role of Max von Meierling, Norma Desmond's butler. However, Max also had a big secret. Stroheim was born in Austria in 1885. He immigrated to America around 1909 and worked around Hollywood until he began working for director D.W. Griffith. Stroheim is known as a director, but he had a decent acting career with 74 credits. Many of these were playing the enemy of America. One of his better-known films was La Grande Illusion, 1937. As a director, he was obsessed with details that often caused massive cost overruns. He was fired many times, and when Gloria Swanson fired him from Queen Kelly, he was done as a director. Nancy Olson played Betty Schaefer, the bright-eyed script reader. Olson was born in Wisconsin in 1924. She transferred from University of Wisconsin to UCLA. It was not long before she was discovered acting and signed by Paramount Studios in 1948. As a lovely blonde with peach and cream style, she began getting co-starring roles 
after a single uncredited bit part in Portrait of Jenny, 1948. She had a bigger role in Canadian Pacific, 1949, before she was offered a very important role in Sunset Boulevard, 1950. She was paid $5,000 for this role and received a Best Supporting Actress nomination. She worked well with William Holden, and the pair went on to make Union Station, 1950, Force of Arms, 1951, and Submarine Command, 1951. Olson worked with John Wayne in the pro-HUAC anti-communist film Big Jim McLean, 1952, and with Steve Forrest in So Big, 1953. In the mid-1950s, Olson left acting to raise her children. When she divorced in 1957, she tried to return to acting, but they no longer wanted to cast her as the fresh young face. Disney Studios cast Olsen as Fred McMurray's love interest in The Absent-Minded Professor, 1961, and Son of Flubber, 1963. She fit well with Disney's image and made other films with them such as Pollyanna, 1960, and Snowball Express, 1972. She made a cameo appearance in the terrible Robin Williams' Flubber 1997 movie. Olsen did some television work in the 1970s and 80s, but in the 1980s she retired from film work. Fred Clark played studio manager Sheldrake. Clark was born in California in 1914. While attending Stanford University, a chance acting role landed Clark a scholarship to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. He began working in community theater and summer stock. In 1938, he got his first role on Broadway. Clark's career was placed on hold when the U.S. entered World War II. He served as a Navy pilot in 1942, but later joined the Army and spent almost two years with the Third Army in Europe. When he returned, he was given a role by director Michael Kurtz in the Noor classic The Unsuspected, 1947. Since he was able to play a villain so well, he continued to receive work in films such as Ride the Pink Horse, 1947, Cry of the City, 1948, Flamingo Road, 1949, White Heat, 1949, alias Nick Beale, 1949, Sunset Boulevard, 1950, The Jackpot, 1950, The Lemon Drop Kid, 1951, and Meet Me After the Show, 1951. All of these films took advantage of Clark's sour demeanor, and he became the guy you love to hate. Clark spent much of the 1950s playing the same type of role on television. Other movies where he played his trademark role were The Caddy, 1953, with Martin and Lewis, Marilyn Monroe's How to Marry a Millionaire, 1953, The Solid Gold Cadillac, 1956, Don't Go Near the Water, 1957, The Mating Game, 1959, Auntie Mame, 1958, where he played a skin flint banker, Bells Are Ringing, 1960, Visit to a Small Planet, 1960, Boys Night Out, 1962, and Move Over, Darling, 1963. He was also in some real dogs like Dr. Goldfoot and the Bikini Machine, 1965, I Sailed to Tahiti with an All-Girl Crew, 1968, and The Terrible Skidoo, 1968, directed by Otto Preminger and starring Jackie Gleason and Carol Channing. Clark died in 1968 at the age of 54. Jack Webb played the role of Artie Green, up-and-coming director that was everybody's friend. Webb was born in California in 1920. After his father abandoned the family, he was raised in poverty by his mother and grandmother. As an adult, he began working as a disc jockey and later as a radio show host. One of Webb's early acting roles was in a small role in the film noir classic He Walked by Night, 1948. During production, he became friends with an LAPD consultant. He pitched the idea of Dragnet to NBC, and it became a radio show in 1949 and a television show in late 1951. The show lasted until 1959. Webb directed and starred in five films, Dragnet 1954, Pete Kelly's Blues 1955, The D.I. 1957, 30 1959, and The Last Time I Saw Archie 1961. After the last two films bombed, he became head of production at Warner Brothers Television. He was fired the same year after making disastrous changes to 77 Sunset Strip, 1958. He was unemployed for two years until Universal hired Webb to make a Dragnet TV movie. After this movie did well, he was tasked with creating Dragnet 1967. 
This new dragnet paired the stiff Officer Friday with a humorous Officer Gannon played by Harry Morgan. Following Dragnet 1967, Webb went on to create Adam 12 in 1968 and Emergency in 1972. He protected the image he had created for Dragnet and when asked to play Dean Wormer in director John Landis's Animal House 1978, he flatly refused. Webb died of a heart attack in 1982 at the age of 62. Cecil B. DeMille played himself as a director that was still working and had worked with Norma Desmond in the old days. DeMille was born in Massachusetts in 1881. Both his parents were playwrights, and when his father died, his mother opened a girls' school and a theater company. DeMille followed his brother to the New York Academy of Dramatic Arts and made his stage debut in 1900. He acted and managed his mother's company for a dozen years. In 1913, DeMille, Jesse L. Lasky, and Samuel Goldwyn formed the Lasky Film Company, which later became Paramount Pictures. The next year, DeMille produced The Squall Man, 1914, which was the first feature-length film produced in Hollywood. He tended to develop his own talent, and one of his most important was Gloria Swanson. He produced and directed 80 films and was involved in many more. DeMille supposedly believed Americans were curious only about money and sex, and many of his films featured these themes. He also made many biblical epics such as The King of Kings, 1927, The Ten Commandments, 1923, and The Crusades, 1935. Other important films include Don't Change Your Husband, 1919, Triumph, 1924, The Sign of the Cross, 1932, the Plainsman 1936 with Gary Cooper and Gene Arthur. The Buccaneer 1938. Union Pacific 1939. Northwest Mounted Police 1940 again with Gary Cooper. Reap the Wild Wind 1942 with John Wayne and Paulette Goddard. Samson and Delilah 1949 with Hedy Lamar and Victor Mature. It's Hadley. The Greatest Show on Earth 1952 with Jimmy Stewart. Charlton Heston, Betty Hutton, Cornell Wilde, and Gloria Graham, and The Ten Commandments, 1956, featuring too many to mention. DeMille died in 1959 at the age of 77. Hedda Hopper played herself in this movie. Early in her career, she made dozens of films and was known as the Queen of the Quickies. In 1936, she started a gossip radio show and two years later started a 28-year career as a newspaper gossip columnist. In Sunset Boulevard, 1950, she showed her power in Hollywood. Her son, William Hopper, became famous as investigator Paul Drake in the Perry Mason television series that began in 1957. Story As the credits roll, the camera tracks along Sunset Boulevard. As sirens begin to wail, the narrator begins to tell his tale. Sunset Boulevard is important because some of the first filming in Hollywood took place here. The narrator tells that there has been a murder at one of the opulent mansions in the 10,000 block. The narrator also tells that it will be a big story because an old-time star was involved. When the police get to the house, there is a young man, Joe Gillis, William Holden, floating dead in the swimming pool. You see, the body of a young man was found floating in the pool of her mansion, with two shots in his back and one in his stomach. Nobody important, really. Just a movie writer with a couple of B pictures to his credit. The poor dope. He always wanted a pool. The view is from the bottom of the pool looking up past the body to the dry policeman. This shot was made by placing a mirror on the bottom of the pool and shooting into the mirror. Joe takes the narration back six months before his murder. Joe is in a small apartment trying to write a story that could be sold. The repo men are trying to take his car back for late payments but he has hidden the car. Joe decides to hit up his buddies for some money. First, he goes to Paramount Pictures producer Sheldrake, Fred Clark, to see about a script he has at the studio. Sheldrake calls the reader's department to get their report. The report is brought in by Betty Schaefer, Nancy Olson. Before she realizes Joe is in the room, she classifies the script as junk. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Gillis, but I just didn't think it was any good. I found it flat and trite. Exactly what kind of material do you recommend? James Joyce? Dostoevsky? I just think that pictures should say a little something. Joe begs for a job, then begs for money. He drives to Swab's drugstore where many of the out-of-work writers and actors hang out. He then visits his agent who is out playing golf. 
The agent dismisses him, saying poverty is good for writers. Joe heads back towards town, and he reconciles himself to returning to his newspaper job back in Dayton, Ohio. He then sees the repo men and speeds away. With them not far behind, Joe's car blows a tire, and he pulls into a deserted mansion. Joe drives the car into the garage. Inside the garage is a car that hasn't been driven since 1932. However, the mansion is not deserted and a woman calls out from the second floor demanding to know why Joe has kept her waiting so long. A dour butler in tails and white gloves opens the door and instructs Joe to come in. The woman calls from upstairs for Joe to come up. The butler, Max Van Meierling, von Stroheim, tells Joe that if he needs help with the coffin to call. In the room upstairs, the woman, who is wearing a leopard printed turban and round sunglasses, starts talking about burying her pet chimpanzee, which is lying dead on the table. Joe explains that he is not the undertaker, and then he recognizes the woman as silent screen star Norma Desmond, Gloria Swanson. They trade some pretty intense dialogue about the movies getting small. You're Norma Desmond. Used to be in silent pictures. Used to be big. I am big. It's the pictures that got small. Uh I knew there was something wrong. Norma finds out that he is a writer and throws him out, but then she has other thoughts. She asks him to read a rather large script that she has written. The picture is about Salome, and she plans to use it as a return, not a comeback. Norma demands he sit, and Joe does, yielding control at the early stage of the relationship. Joe reads as Norma watches. The real chimp mortician shows up and buries the ape. Of course, this foreshadows Joe as the new ape and shows his fate. Joe narrates that he has a plan and strokes Norma's ego about the play. Norma offers Joe the editing job. Norma insists that Joe stay and Max puts him in the room over the garage. Max and Joe have an interesting conversation in the bedroom. Say, uh, she's quite a character, that Norma Desmond. She was the greatest of them all. You wouldn't know. You're too young. In one week, she received 17,000 fan letters. Men bribed a hairdresser to get a lock of her hair. There was a Maharaja who came all the way from India to beg one of her silk stockings. Later, he strangled himself with it. Well, I sure turned into an interesting driveway. You did, sir. As Joe looks out the window, there is an abandoned tennis court and a dry pool with rats. He watches the funeral of the chimp from above. When Joe wakes in the morning, someone is playing the pipe organ and all his belongings have been brought from his apartment to the room above the garage. Norma has even paid the back rent on his apartment. Joe goes to work on the script, but the work is slow because Norma second guesses everything he does. The house is covered with pictures of Norma from an earlier time. Two to three times a week, they would watch movies in Norma's living room. One of the films they watch is Queen Kelly, 1929. This film starred Gloria Swanson. Stroheim was the director and Swanson was the producer of the film. She later fired Stroheim for going over budget. Gloria talks about having faces and not needing dialogue. Still wonderful, isn't it? And no dialogue. We didn't need dialogue. We had faces. Sometimes Gloria's friends would come over to play bridge. Joe called them the Waxworks, and they were silent actors whose time had passed. All of these actors played themselves and include Buster Keaton, Ann Q. Nielsen, and H.B. Warner. While Joe is emptying the ashtray for Norma, he sees that the repo men have come to the door. Max tells him that they are towing the car. He asks Norma for money, but she is too busy playing cards. Norma tells him it doesn't matter because they have a car. She begins taking him for car rides and later she decks him out in new clothes. The tailor makes him feel bad when he recommends a purchase saying, as long as the lady's paying, why not take the more expensive one? In December, rainwater starts leaking through the roof of the garage apartment and Joe was moved into the, quote, husband's room in the big house. Joe notes that there are no locks and Max tells him that Norma is sometimes suicidal. It slips out that Max is writing the fan mail that Norma has been getting. Norma has bought Joe a tuxedo for the New Year's Eve party. When he gets there, the band is playing, but no other guests are invited, just Joe and Norma. You can literally feel the crushing fall that Norma is about to take as Joe squirms like a trapped rat. When she says she loves him, 
Joe screams at her to grow up and storms out of the mansion. Norma exits to her room and they show a close-up of the door with no locks. Poor Joe walks in the rain to the party at the house of his only friend, assistant director Artie Green, Jack Webb. Well, what do you know, Joe Gillis? Hi, Artie. Oh, you've been keeping that gorgeous face of yours. In a deep freeze. I almost reported you to the Bureau of Missing Persons. Fans, you all know Joe Gillis, the well-known screenwriter, uranium smuggler, and black daddy suspect. <laughs> now, this part freaked me out a little. I'm used to seeing Webb playing Sergeant Joe Friday. His arms never moved when he walked, he was so stiff. Artie is smiling in the life of the party. It's really unsettling. Of course, Artie's girlfriend, Betty Schaefer, is there as well. Betty tracks Joe down and says she has gone through his old scripts and there are some good ideas in some of them. Joe agrees to work with her, sort of. They begin reciting movie lines to each other and it seems for a moment they may kiss. Joe calls Norma's house and Max tells him that Norma took the razor from his room and cut her wrist. He runs out on the party and goes back to Norma. Joe says Norma is the only person in this town that's been good to him. She also says she will continue to try and kill herself. As the New Year is played in, Joe goes to Norma and presumably they make love. Time passes and it is spring or summer as the pool is open. Betty calls the house looking for Joe. When Norma asks who it was, Max says it was someone looking for a stray dog. Norma tells Max to take the script to Cecil B. DeMille at Paramount. Norma and Joe head out a few nights later to play bridge with the waxworks. Norma is out of cigarettes, so they stop at Swab's Pharmacy. Joe goes in, and Artie and Betty are there. Betty is super excited to see Joe, and she has generated interest in one of his scripts from Sheldrake. When Max comes in to get him, he forgets to buy the cigarettes. Where are my cigarettes? Where are you? Norma, you're smoking too much. Norma sometimes puts on shows for Joe and does a pretty good impression of Chaplin as the tramp. Joe is thinking only about Betty and the script. Paramount Studios calls, but it is only an assistant and Norma refuses to talk to him. Three days later, Joe, Norma, and Max head to the studio in her 1928 Isato Fascini Tipo 8A. I killed that Italian. Many of the people on the lot and crew recognize Norma from the old days. They head to stage 18 where DeMille is actually filming Samson and Delilah 1949. When DeMille is told she is coming, he comments on how bad the script she sent is. DeMille greets Norma warmly until he finds out that she has been getting calls from one of his assistants. He calls the assistant and finds out that the man is trying to rent the car for another movie. DeMille tells him to find another car. DeMille breaks up the throng of fans around Norma and he kindly sends her away with a vague promise because even he can't crush her dreams once she starts crying. I just want to work again. You don't know what it means to know that you want me. Nothing would please me more, Norma, if if it were possible. And remember, darling, I don't work before 10 in the morning and never after 4.30 in the afternoon. Outside, Max tells Joe that he and Norma used to have large offices. Joe sees Betty and at first hides and then goes to talk to her. She pitches working together again. She also mentions that Artie is out of town and that they are engaged. Max finds out that all the studio wanted was the car. Norma comes outside glowing, thinking the deal is done. Norma starts going through crazy treatments, getting ready for the role she thinks is coming. After that, an army of beauty experts invaded her house on Sunset Boulevard. She went through a merciless series of treatments. Like an athlete training for the Olympic Games, she counted every calorie. I feel sorry for her during this time, knowing the fall she is going to take. Norma tells Joe that she knows he has been going out at night. He has been going out to meet with Betty and working on the script. Betty slowly falls in love with Joe. My father was an electrician here till he died. Mother still works in wardrobe. Second generation, huh? Third. Grandma did stunt work for Pearl White. I come from a picture family. Naturally, they expected me to become a great star. So I had ten years of dramatic lessons, diction, dancing. Then the studio made a test. Well, they didn't like my nose. Slanted this way a little. So I went to a doctor and had it fixed. They made more tests than they were crazy about my nose. Only they didn't like my acting. Joe tries to keep it on the up and up. 
Joe pulls the car in late one night and Max is waiting in the shadows. Max says that Norma will never find out that the film is not being made. He also says he discovered her at 16, directed her first picture, and was her first husband. I made her a star, and I cannot let her be destroyed. You made her a star? Yes. I directed all her early films. There were three young directors who showed promise in those days. D.W. Griffith, Cecil B. DeMille, and Max von Meiling. And she's turned you into a servant. It was I who asked to come back, humiliating as it may seem. I could have continued my career. Only I found everything unendurable after she had left me. You see, I was her first husband. He works as a servant because he can't bear to be away from her. Norma finds the script with Joe and Betty's names on it. One night, Betty is upset because Artie proposed to her. She confesses that she is in love with Joe, and they get all kissy face. Joe really doesn't want to hurt Artie or Betty. When he gets home, he hears Norma call Betty and imply that Joe is a man of low morals. Joe takes the phone from Norma and invites Betty out to find out the truth. Norma breaks down and just happens to mention that she has purchased a handgun. Betty comes to the house and Joe gives her the rap that he is a gigolo. Betty still wants him to come with her. This is an enormous place. Eight master bedrooms. A sunken tub in every bathroom. There's a bowling alley in the cellar. It's lonely here. So she got herself a companion. Very simple setup. Older woman who's well-to-do younger man who's not doing too well. Can you figure it out yourself? No. All right, I'll give you a few more clues. No. I haven't heard any of this. I never got those telephone calls and I've never been in this house. Now get your things together and let's get out of here. But Joe drives her away. After Joe chases Betty away, Norma is waiting at the top of the stairs like a deranged vulture. Joe begins packing and returns the expensive gifts that Norma has bought him. She threatens to kill herself again and goes and gets the gun. During the argument, he tells her about the car and that the fan mail is sent by Max. You heard him? I'm a star. Norma, you're a woman of 50. Now grow up. There's nothing tragic about being 50. Not unless you try to be 25. Max says, Madame is the greatest star of all. Norma starts to lose touch with reality and begins making crazy faces. Joe continues to walk out and Norma follows him down and shoots him in the back. He continues walking away and she shoots him again, spinning him around. She shoots him in the stomach and he falls into the pool. Dead Joe talks about how gentle people are with you once you're dead. Dead Joe also thinks that the headlines will kill Norma. All the newspaper crew and gossip people are there. Hedda Hopper is in Norma's room, broadcasting with no regard for Norma. Norma is in her own world until she hears that the cameras have arrived. Max becomes the director again as Norma arrives at the top of the stairs. Max calls lights and asks if she is ready. She asks what the scene is and Max calls action. As she slowly descends the staircase, all the people watch. Norma stops at the bottom of the stairs and makes a speech about being happy to return to pictures. You don't know how much I've missed all of you. And I promise you I'll never desert you again. Because after Salome, we'll make another picture and another picture. You see, this is my life. It always will be. There's nothing else. Just us. And the cameras. And those wonderful people out there in the dark. She then utters the famous line, All right, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up. All right, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up. Notes. They shot an ending where bodies in the morgue are telling how they died and Joe is just one of the bodies. Test audiences hated it, and it sounds pretty bad. As you watch this movie, study Gloria Swanson's hands and face. She uses silent film methods that really bring out the expression and the awkwardness of the scene. Here's the world-famous short summary. 
May-December couple has a few bumps. If you enjoyed this week's show, please tell your friends. And if you really want to help, drop over to iTunes and give me a review. If you want to comment, recommend a movie, or just say hi, follow the links in the show note to my site. Beware the Moors.